This is Category 5 Technology TV. Now, last week, Jeff, uh, you and I were talking about a an app that was pulled from the iTunes store. Yes, it's part of the news. Uh, it was. Yeah. Uh, it was a security app that um, uh, seemed to say that uh, that basically Apple didn't want something in the app store that was uh, telling users that it was uh, that they had exploits on their phones. Yeah, that's right. It had gone through, I think, the first three levels of approval, and then uh, by the fourth stage, Apple pulled it, and uh, so it was kind of a big hubbub. Can you believe shortly after we ran that story, uh, the popular RunKeeper Fitness app was mm -hmm. revealed to have uh, exploits that were basically leaking uh, confidential user data to third parties. Uh, this raises some very real concerns with regards to privacy, security, the apps that are in your app store, and the app acceptance process. But more than that, it shows us uh, that we're apt to trust apps that just happen to be in the app store. You install Absolutely. them thinking that they're trustworthy. Well, I mean, they're so easy. I mean, you pull up the app store, you pull up, you know, whatever software you're using for your phone, your tablet, and it, there's millions of apps. It's like, oh, I'm going to try this one. I don't like that. <laughs> I'm going to try this. And we just use them not really thinking about what's going on in the back end. And, not necessarily. You know, and yeah. so, I mean, that, that story with the RunKeeper kind of makes you think. We're going to learn more about that tonight. Proofpoint is an international leader in advanced cybersecurity solutions. And to help shed light on the problem, please help me welcome the Vice President of Mobile Security at Proofpoint, Dave Jevons. Dave, it's so nice to have you here. Hey guys, it's great to be with you tonight. Thanks for joining us. And uh, before we really get into our interview and our discussion here tonight, could you just give us a little bit of a brief rundown, a, a resume, uh, so to speak, for the viewers who uh, who may may or may not know about Proofpoint? Uh, tell us a little bit about your background when it comes to device and data security, if you could. Sure. Well, I've uh, I've been at Proofpoint a little while now as head of mobile security. I came to the company uh, through an acquisition. They actually bought my mobile security company, which was uh, a great thing to join the Proofpoint team um, and get exposure globally for what we're doing in mobile security. But my background really started back in the uh, University of Calgary where I got my master's degree. And uh, I was on a ski lift one day uh, at Sunshine Village and the guy sitting next to me said, hey, how'd you like a job at Apple? I work there in the research department. <laughs> well, I thought about it for about two seconds said yeah so uh, I started my career in computer science uh, here uh, in California where I live now at Apple computer and then I've done a bunch of different startups and uh, been in security since 95 and built security products for internet security that pretty much every bank in uh, in North America and Europe uses and um, actually on device security I had a company called iron key which made hardware encrypted flash drives and secure web browsing stuff that uh, was very, very successful. And uh, now I've been in the mobile security business for about four or five years. Very good. We'll talk about being at the right place at the right time, eh? Yeah. <laughs> How many people can say that? Uh, okay, RunKeeper is big in the news this week because this is a popular fitness app that tracks geolocation information. Where have I been jogging? Where have I been? Uh, and, and there's a lot of private information stored in that app. So to find out that this RunKeeper app is actually kind of bleeding out this, uh, this private information to a third party uh, is, is rather shocking and, and really stands to tell us that, you know, maybe we shouldn't be quite so uh, trustworthy of all the apps that are in the App Store. Can you share with us a little bit, Dave, about uh, your knowledge about the RunKeeper app and what has happened uh, over the past week? Yeah, so RunKeeper is a you know fitness app that uh, tracks your activity, where you're going, and um, actually they've got a history of security problems. They've got security problems that have been documented as far back as 2013 where they had uh, things that could actually allow people to access your accounts without mm -hmm. your password and uh, could have allowed internet worms to be spread through their fitness system. Um, this latest problem that's come to light is they were using a um, an advertising library called Keep and um, they had, according to them, had a bug in their software and uh, it was actually tracking you and leaking your data not only while you thought the app was running, but also in the background. So oh. they could send it messages and things, and it would actually send information unbeknownst to you. What kind of wow. what kind of data beyond geolocation? So to to clarify what that means, this is an app that tracks where I go. Mm -hmm. 
And so if that's the case and somebody has record now of all of these geo coordinates of where I've been, you can establish a fair bit about a person. But beyond that, what, uh, what kind of information has been leaked because of this bug? Well, so it's not just the bug, it's the whole ad library system, but it's tracking things about email habits, it's tracking browser histories and cookies. So especially on the Android platform, it's actually able to look at everywhere you've been web surfing, um, which could include cookies and other things. So it knows pretty much everything about you. Wow. That's so crazy. with this information that's been accessed, is there a requirement for the third party to delete the information that they've obtained legally? There's not. So I took a look at their privacy policies and um, the very fact that you use their services, which of course you don't know because you're using RunKeeper. You don't know you're right. using the service. The very fact that you use this service means you have granted them permission to take your data and uh, and they actually have permission to sell it. Now, it, but I mean, if you if you've say you've used the RunKeeper app, but they're using advertising with this other service, you haven't expressly signed on to the advertising service. Yeah, is this like you've accepted their policies by proxy? Is that the idea correct. here? Yeah, this is a thing that we all need to start thinking about, especially in the app world, which is the very fact that you use an app, you're agreeing to their privacy policy, but you may also be agreeing tacitly to the privacy policies of many other ad networks or software that they've compiled into their product that you don't know anything about and you actually don't really have any visibility to that privacy policy uh, wow. yeah that's so okay. they have absolutely no legal requirement to delete that data none wow none that's and in unreal. fact they can change their privacy policy whenever they want and the privacy policy that they have online at the time is their current privacy policy and you agreed to it by very just visiting their website or using a app that uh, is sending data to them. So we're looking, uh, wow. talking kind of predominantly about this RunKeeper app. Uh, this is a problem that's bigger than just RunKeeper. We're just, this is a good example because it's current and it's something yeah. that is in heavy use and, and it's in the news right now uh, that this has been exploited. Uh, RunKeeper themselves, uh, I have to think that they must have known that this information was being leaked to keep the third party. Um, why did it take a complaint from the Norwegian uh, Consumer Council in order to actually bring this to light to the consumers? Uh, there, well, there's no requirement for these folks to tell you that information, for one. Um, it's not in their best interest to tell you too, because they're making money off of selling your information. Okay. Um, so, and is that is that speculative or is this an actual no, fact? Yeah, it's a fact. Okay. Wow. Now, right. when you actually look at privacy policies, this is another big issue. Take a look at your apps on your phone and actually see how many have privacy policies. You don't have to have a privacy policy to get an app published on any of the major app stores. Hmm. Really? No. So if you look at the top 10 apps on the app stores, most of those will have a privacy policy. But many days you can go look and some of them won't. But if you look broadly across all apps across app stores, and I've looked at 11 million apps in my work at Proofpoint across both Android and iOS app stores, about half of the apps don't have privacy policies. And some of them are fraudulent. They actually just point you to like the Facebook privacy policy. No or way. Google or stuff like that, yeah. So speaking of, you know, Android versus iOS, are there any particular platforms, including, say, BlackBerry or Windows Mobile, uh, are any of the platforms safer than the other? Um, one could argue that the old BlackBerry uh, platform is the most secure of the ones you mentioned that does have end-to-end -end encryption. But, of course, it's the least usable. They don't really have apps. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Oh, it's true, folks. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I tried to install Skype on here so that I could talk to you tonight, Dave, and it just doesn't have it. Yeah. So um, uh, I'd say that I don't. I don't actually think either. If you if we just look at Android and and the iOS operating system that runs okay. on your iPhone or your iPad, um, I'm not going to say that technically either one is actually more secure than the other. Um, that's, a, I think, a misconception that 
people think, oh, the iPhones or iOS is more secure than Android. I, I'm, I don't believe that to be true. Um, but there are some really important differences. So the on the iPhone, it's a lot harder to download apps from just anywhere you want. It can be done. That's another misconception that you can't just download apps from anywhere you want. You actually can. And there are people running rogue app stores all the time that people sure. go and download. They, you know, they can get every game for free. They can get videos and things like that. That's why people do it. Um, but on Android, it's really easy to do. You just turn a little switch off, and then you can download them. And you know, Amazon runs an app store. Samsung runs an app store. Oh, Baidu oh. runs an app store. So the security controls on those app stores are much more uh, lenient than, say, on Google Play. Um, the other thing that we have, the problem with, with Android, is that the older versions don't update. And the updates were required to be pushed by your phone company, and the phone companies are pretty bad at that. Uh, so if you're running Android like 4.4 or older, which is half the world, um, you will get no security updates. So in those cases, yeah, that's much less secure than buying a new iPhone with iOS 9 on it. Wow. Okay. So if you're a, a consumer, what should be your biggest fear or concern when it comes to these kind of apps? Because people will just download not really paying attention and not understanding all of this other information that nobody tells you. So what should be that biggest concern? So I think, you know, it, it, one, make sure your operating system's up to date. So when they offer you the new version of the operating system, you should take it. Um, if you look at all, you know how we've been getting, I don't know if you guys are iPhone users, but um, for those of us who are, you know, there's been a number of updates over the last couple of months. Um, those are not updates to add tons of features. Sure. Those are updates for to fix security bugs. Right. Gotcha. And these are security bugs that aren't necessarily out in the open and, and revealed to the end consumer. Uh, we're speaking with Dave Jevons. He's the VP of Mobile Security at uh, Proofpoint. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can find out more about them at proofpoint.com. Uh, Dave, how many malicious apps are we talking about in, uh, in either of the main um, app stores? Uh, it depends. I mean, there can be thousands at any one time. So... Generally, the Google App Store, the Google Play has, has uh, you know, maybe a few thousand. The Apple App Store is much more uh, clean, but, you know, you'll have instances, for example, a few months ago, we had something called Xcode Ghost. It actually infected the app developers, and then they, oh, right, yeah. right, and they published apps not knowing that they had malware in their apps. We found over 4,000 of those apps at, at, at live. Um, wow. Yeah, I, I was reading a statistic, even just something as benign as like a Bible app and realizing there are 5,000 different Bible apps and yeah. over 200 of them contain malware. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So now it's what? you feel like you're prey in a way. Not not <laughs> <laughs> that pun was not intentional, <laughs> but it was awesome. <laughs> Good one. When you, you know, when you look at some of these rogue app stores, too, where, for example, you, I've done a lot of work in, in researching these things, and um, the, like for on, on the iPhone, for example, um, they'll have tens of thousands of apps for free. So every game you would have to pay for, like Grand Theft Auto, or um, if you want to buy business apps, that stuff's all available for free. Well, when we looked at all those apps, every single one of them had been modified. They're not the original version. They've all been tampered with in some way. These are in the third-party app stores? Yeah. Somebody has tampered yeah. with these? Yeah. So does this only affect, does that particular issue, so having a third-party app store on your device, does that only affect users who have uh, rooted their devices? No. So the bad guys have found out ways on, um, on iOS to get apps on your phone without jailbreaking it. And then on Android, of course, as you know, you can just say, I want to use third parties, you know, places to download apps. And you can get apps from any app store you want. You can have apps just, you can get them just from clicking on web pages. Hmm. You mean, can do that on iOS too. If you get it, right. if they get an enterprise certificate and you hit trust, then you can access an, any third party app store and, and you can download apps outside of Apple's control. I think the risk there, and, and phishing scams are a huge big deal these days, and Oops. trickery and social engineering. And so it's so easy, I think, for somebody to develop something that's rogue and trick you into wanting it. Because, hey, if I can, what? There's an app that will let me watch all of my favorite TV shows for free? 
Mm -hmm. that's where I think we run the risk. Hey, yeah, I'm going to say yes to that question, right? Yeah, when we looked at our customers who are mostly businesses, we found 40% of them had employees accessing those rogue app stores. Wow. <laughs> so half the companies have people doing it. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. So one of the other features that when it comes to apps is there's websites that will allow you to make an app. You know, like I, I think of uh, appmaker.com and stuff like that. Now, not necessarily that specific site, but do those sites generally embed software that could be malicious or do they try and run mm. clean? Or, or, you know, for somebody who doesn't have a p programming background, it's going, oh, I can make an app for free for my, you know, my school classroom. Is that a dangerous way to go? I wouldn't say it's dangerous, but I think you need to be careful. So make sure that the tool that you're using or the, or the service that you're using is reputable. Um, nothing comes for free. Mm -hmm. Nothing good anyway. Lots of malware comes for free. Um, <laughs> and then also be aware about what's actually going into your app. So, or, you know, what are they doing? What is their privacy policy? What are they tracking from your users? What data are they asking from your users? Where's that data going? Because a lot of these things are embedding libraries in there that are, you know, taking user information. And if users don't read the privacy policy, oh, well. Hmm. Yeah, too bad, so sad. You said yes to the wrong question. Um, totally. We're speaking with uh, Dave Jevons. He's the VP of Mobile Security at Proofpoint. Dave, can you uh, share with us, uh, we're talking a lot about privacy policies here. Uh, what other things do we as consumers or as companies need to be concerned with beyond just simple privacy? So certainly malware is one thing. Looking at malicious apps, where they're coming from. I mean, they, they exist, they're out there. As we mentioned, you know, Xcode Ghost had 4,000 of them on iPhones in one day. Um, hmm. And that, so that stuff's out there. You have to realize it. You have to understand what data you've got on your phone. The next one is passwords. So right. what are those apps doing with your password? Lots of apps are sending your passwords around. There's a, there's a guy on the App Store who keeps writing these Instagram helper apps, and they keep getting approved and he steals your username and password, logs into your Instagram account from his servers, and starts putting ads in your Instagram so that all your friends and everybody else is seeing ads that he's no posting. Way. That's an example. Now, when you log into your, you know, if an app pops up, log into the Game Center. How do you know that it's the real Game Center? They're not just stealing your password. So this gets down to password, you know, smart password usage, which is obviously don't use the same password on your email as on your iTunes account or your Play account, and certainly not as in your bank account. But in modern times, the most important password to keep secure is actually your email account. Yeah, and I'd have to agree because, I mean, we all use our email account for our online banking, for example. So what happens when a user gets in there and says, forgot password, and is able to recover their password by yeah. compromising your email account. That's uh, right. It also brings to mind, um, we've really seen come to light uh, again this week, a lot of stuff in the news and, and it seems to be the case more and more. Um, TeamViewer uh, had a, an issue where all of a sudden it was in the news that TeamViewer had been hacked and all these users are reporting that people are remotely accessing their computers while they sleep and going into their online banking and transferring funds away and, and this kind of stuff happening with Team viewer and it turns out that the news is debunked by the fact that no these users in fact were using the same team viewer password on other services that had been compromised and those passwords allowed those malicious users into their computers through team viewer and they were able to compromise their computers so again it boils down to uh, be, being smart about your password usage does it really Dave, Dave does it come down to education is there more than just education to this uh, to protecting ourselves for sure. I mean, education is important. Um, one of the things that I also do in addition to Proofpoint is I run the anti-phishing working group, the APWG. And, you know, we run e-crime conferences every year. There's one in Toronto next week. And um, so education is something that we, we see as important. And um, everybody listening to the show needs to think about what their passwords are. They need to be different. I mean, it's safer to write your passwords down on a piece of paper and keep them in your desk at home Hmm. then use the same password everywhere. Um, so that's a, that's a thing. you got to think about phishing attacks. We're seeing a lot of them on mobile now where they're coming through SMS. 
and they're saying, hey, for example, um, your Apple iTunes account is about to expire. Click here, and it takes you to a spoof website that right. looks really similar. Yep. That's a big one going on right now. Um, same thing on Google Play. Those are very heavily fished. And if they can get that information, well, did you back all your stuff up to iCloud? They might be able to recover it now. So wow. then you can have all your data taken. Oh, um, man. And that password, too, right, could be your email password, and now you're really owned. Right. So, I mean, we are just talking about, you know, an app on a PC. One of the questions we have from our chat room is Windows 10 has an app store that has all the same apps as your mobile device would. Mm. So does this mean that those apps are now compromising your PC as well as your mobile device? Or yeah, has, or is it, there has it crossed over? Yeah. Or is it it's a different a type of back end? No, well, it's a different back end on the Windows 10, although they're trying to bring them together at, at Microsoft to have sort of a common infrastructure. Um, and, you know, their mobile strategy is evolving quite a bit. Um, so we haven't seen how that's finally going to shake out about their Android support and their iOS support. That strategy has been changing over the last probably eight months or so. Um, but uh, there have definitely been apps that run on your PC or your Mac that if you plug your phone into your PC or Mac, will infect your mobile device. That is the easiest way to get infected. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. There's a bunch of that going on. No doubt. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and we are speaking tonight with Dave Jevons. He's the VP of Mobile Security at Proofpoint. We've got to take a really quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what you can do to protect yourself, both in your company and, uh, and uh, personally as well. Stick around. Jeff Weston. Yeah, man. You're building a brand new, beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? You need hosting. One of the things about a hosting account is you don't want to have limitations put on your website. It's true. How much hard drive space do you have? How many email accounts? How many domains can point to it? Well, we've got an amazing deal for you. For a very limited time, cat5.tv slash dreamhost. For just $5 and a bit of change per month, you are going to get unlimited website hosting, unlimited email accounts on that hosting uh, service. You are also going to receive a free domain name. Ooh. So your own .com. Nice. To put that amazing website that you've been working on it's on true. there. If you run, if you want to build a WordPress site, fine. Sign up. Cat5.tv slash dreamhost. Just don't put Panama Papers on it. Just don't do it. But hey, uh, it's a great deal, folks. Best deal you're going to find. $5 and change per month. Go to cat5.tv slash dreamhost. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. Tonight we are speaking with uh, Dave Jevons. And Dave is the VP of Mobile Security at Proofpoint. We're speaking about uh, some of the exploits that have found their way into your favorite app stores and how we can protect ourselves from those. Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. It's great to be with you guys. Dave, can you think of any standout malware that has made its way into popular, uh, popular app stores that you've had to deal with with Proofpoint that really stands out as being very clever or something that uh, our viewers may even fall for? Well, I've seen some things recently. Uh, I'm thinking of, of a couple of them on the Android platform that are... Um, they're fairly benign when you run them, but actually once you get them out of the App Store environment and onto your device, they're very powerful and they look like the most sophisticated malicious code we've seen on the PC world. So it's clearly mm -hmm. the, the PC type of people coming into the mobile world. Um, Xbox, for example, looks like a uh, Adobe uh, Flash plugin. And um, what it really is, is it's a phishing app. Um, so it will uh, detect up to basically 40 different banking apps, as well as Google Play um, and Facebook that are running on your phone. And when you fire those apps up, it is running in the background and it pops up a login screen in front of it and then steals your credentials. Oh um, that one is actually, can actually also function as a ransomware app. So it uh, there is a command and control that the bad guys can send to it that will um, lock out your phone 
and uh, and then demand that you get a debit card and type in the prepaid debit card number to unlock your phone. Oh, that is scary stuff. Um, so seeing ransomware actually finding its way onto your mobile devices. Why are the App Store developers, thinking of uh, Google themselves and Apple, why are they not doing more to, uh, to protect users against these kinds of malicious apps from finding their way into the App Stores? Well, I do think they are constantly getting better. It is a, a game that is impossible to 100% solve. Um, I, I do think they are getting better. I think the folks at Google, for example, have been doing a lot of work in the last couple of years to make sure that people with modern versions of Android get over-the-air updates. Um, there was a, a bug recently in, in Android that had been around for several years, um, was recently discovered, which can allow complete takeover of your device, um, and Google pushed an emergency patch for that. Now, if you're running an old version of Android, you're not going to get that, so you know, get a new phone. That's, um, yeah, that's what it boils down to. Get a new phone. And if you look on the Apple side, I mean, they are patching, you know, I've been tracking it for maybe a year or two, and every release that comes out, every point release that comes out is fixing somewhere between 30 to 50 serious security vulnerabilities that are being discovered every month. So they're on top of it. They're, they're trying to fix those things. But apps can put zero-day exploits in, and the, we call them zero-days because... We've never seen them before. The There's no guys, time. There's no time. Right, bad guys figured it out, and so it's impossible to have 100% security. So in this, in our modern uh, way of using devices, how has this gotten so out of hand? Why are there not um, things in place to really put this to a stop? Uh, well, because programmers are human and make tons of mistakes, and QA is imperfect. So, I mean, pr there will be bugs forever. The other thing is that the OSs are getting more and more sophisticated, right? So when you got iOS 8 and then iOS 9, they're amazing pieces of technology. I mean, they're incredible. The features that are in there are amazing. But when they add 4,000 new API calls in one major release of an operating system, you're going to have bugs and bad guys exploit it. Hmm. The other thing that we're finding is that it is possible to update your apps without going through App Store review. There are several ways to do it on both platforms. Which means you could have an app that behaves perfectly fine when it goes through an App Store review, does nothing bad. And then three months after it's been released, the bad guys can then update it oh, and man. make it do bad stuff. So we're talking about app developers who place seemingly benign code. It could be a game. It could be a, a seemingly useful app and then push out an update that will make it malicious. Mm -hmm. Is there an approval process to that being pushed out? Ah, so there's two t three ways to update. If you go through the App Store and you do an App Store update, it goes through a much lighter weight review process than when you first submit your app. All right. So when you first submit your app, it can take a couple of weeks. Now, I know from experience of the two weeks amount of time that your app is in review, it's waiting for 1.999 weeks in a queue. It really only take, it, they only analyze it for about 11 minutes before it, it actually gets approved. Um, but when you do an update, it gets goes through a lighter weight update. But what the bad guys have found out, and it's not just bad guys, it's also legitimate software developers, there are ways to update your code that does not involve the App Store. You can push code updates down to, to apps outside of the App Store, and bad guys do it. It's a limited set. You can't do everything, but if the APIs were compiled into your app, um, you can change the way they're being used through um, sure. out-of-band out of uh Updates. I'd imagine that you could, in fact, place bugs, if you will, into your own software in order to exploit it later. So, Absolutely. So if somebody's an app developer, what should they be doing to safeguard themselves from running into the same issue that RunKeeper ran into? Okay, you, very good question. You need to be really, really, really careful about what you're compiling into your app. We find 30 to 40 percent of apps at least are compiling third-party code into them that they have no idea what it really does. Right. They're not reading necessarily the privacy policies or checking on who the developers are that are providing that code. Um, some people will write a game and they'll include multiple ad libraries in it. Well, you might be getting an ad library from some guy in China that's been infected with like iBackdoor, for example. You just compiled that into your app and you just distributed it to your customers or users and you didn't know. So being very careful about 
the third party libraries you put into your app is really critical and it needs to go through the security review that every app should go through before developers release it onto the app store. It's such a hard thing for developers because it's always about we need to push and push and bring out new versions and we've got to be competitive and we've got to make money. If we're distributing an app for free, we've got to generate, we have to have revenue streams. So if an advertiser comes along and says, look, you just pop this little bit of code in there and we will generate revenue for you, it's very appealing for a developer to push that out. Mm -hmm. uh, we're thinking a lot about the developer, uh, the developer here and you know, somebody uh, who's creating apps and distributing them and I, th I think there does have to be an accountability there and a, and a review process of one's own software uh, yeah. but what can we do as consumers so the people who are installing these apps and we don't know if they are safe or if they have this malicious code that's been injected into them what can we do to protect ourselves so a few guidelines nothing's perfect but a few guidelines um, download from legitimate app stores as tempting as it is to go to some other app store where you can get a game for free or download all kinds of paid videos for free, or maybe you want to access adult content apps, just don't do it. That's one. Um, when you're downloading apps, take a look at the reputation, the number of downloads, and really if it's going to be something that you're going to be using to, I don't know, log into uh, your Twitter account or something like that through that app, go read their privacy policy. Also, read, you know, when you fire it up, really pay attention to what it's asking permissions for because apps will tend to ask for permissions and people just say okay and yeah. you really got to look because if you hit okay I mean and it's reading your calendar and your address book and you know maybe on Android your SMS messages or your email or your browser history I mean once you hit okay that data is in many cases just going to be sent off your device yeah, my wife is uh, is really smart to you know, read through these things, and and sometimes we just kind of skip over it and say, yeah, I accept, because the kids will be wanting to install an, a game on on her phone, and and so she'll go through the process because it requires a password. Yeah. She'll say, why does this race car game need access to my photos, my camera, my microphone, and all these other things? And it it, it just goes to show that you know, maybe they've got something in there that is uh, malicious or possibly going to be used for malicious purpose at, an, at a future time. And it's tough too because as a BlackBerry user, for example, as we talked about a little bit earlier in the, in the interview, there really aren't a lot of apps left on the App Store and it's, it's a, it seems to be like a dying platform. Uh, Facebook has severed ties with BlackBerry and so if I want to access Facebook on my device as it's a BlackBerry I have to either go through their website which is a horrible experience on on here or I can install one of these third-party apps that are developed by somebody who I don't know who they are. How do I know I, and this is a rhetorical question but how do I know as a user that that's not going to be revealing my personal information my login ID for Facebook and and possibly information about all my friends uh, to the app developer as well well uh, and it, as you said it's a rhetorical question right because the answer is you don't mm -hmm. and you should check out the origin of the apps too right so I mean some of these app developers go to great pains to make it hard to figure out who they really are They've got, you know, the only way to contact them is a Facebook page or maybe a Gmail link. They may mm -hmm. not have a website. Um, I mean, you'd be surprised where some of these apps are developed. Let me give you an example. Um, there's a very popular business card scanner app. You know, you take a picture of the business card and yeah, then it scans those, it yeah. right, mm -hmm. and loads it. Yeah, loads it into your uh, address book. Do um, you know where that app's made? Do tell. Uh, it's in Shanghai. Um, okay. And then when you actually take a look at it, there's no privacy policy associated with it. You have to actually go and find the company, find where they're located, go to their website, read their privacy policy. What that thing's doing mm. is it's reading your address book and your calendar and right. sending it to servers across China. Oh. And by using that app, you have given them permission to take all that data and do whatever they want. They can make it public if they want. Wow. They can sell it if they want. And furthermore, the one who's bad is you and not them because part of that privacy policy says you got permission of everyone in your address book that you could send their data to them oh man so, so if ever it comes to a lawsuit of course you'd have to do it in the people's republic of china uh -huh. you're the one who's at fault not them 
So two points with that, of course, uh, the thought about it being based in China. Here in Canada, if an app is developed here, we're governed by the Canadian privacy laws, yeah. which are very strict. Mm -hmm. And if we deviate from those, then there are some very serious penalties. So it's not necessarily something, you know, oh, I saw something in China, so I, it's not trustworthy. Not necessarily the case, but nope. they're not governed by the same privacy laws. Right. And second point would be that because it's it's so clever it's so smart that we've brought out uh, an app that is built to communicate with your contact list mm -hmm. it scans photos of business cards in order to put them in your contact list so what's the first thing that you're gonna do I see that it needs access to my contact list that's right approve yeah yep. they've now tricked me into that well yep. You know, I've got a, I've, I've built apps just as demos that you know could get on the app stores no problem. Okay. And you know, you say, hey, I want to share with my friend. You know, our little test app just takes all your contact database off your phone. Now, you have no idea that's happened. Yeah. Wow. And and you know, if you say things like, for example, oh, I'd like to save this to Dropbox. I'd like to have access to Dropbox. When you do that, you've given that app permission to your entire Dropbox, which means. They can take all your files if they want. Oh my! But uh -huh. the, the smart ones are not going to. The smart ones aren't going to delete stuff. They're going to do everything in the background in such a way that you don't see it happening, so that you continue to run this application and continue to feed them valuable information because data is money these days. Mm -hmm. The smart ones just look for files that say like password or <laughs> customer or stuff like that, and just copy those files. All right. So <laughs> when it comes to these apps, they. You know, people, I'm sure they're watching this and look at their phone going, oh, my goodness. All my passwords are in an email. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'm going to delete this app. By uninstalling these apps and looking for a more reputable one, does that safeguard you? Or are these apps leaving the back door in the phone or device so that you're still compromised? So the majority of apps do not leave a, uh, a like a backdoor restart thing it's a it's it's very difficult to do on the iphone platform so unless it's jailbroken your device or has taken advantage of one of these zero days which you know is, there's 30 or so discovered every month but unless it's done that and most of them don't um because the bad guys aren't that smart um only the really bad bad guys are um if you delete it you're usually okay on android i would say most of the time you're okay not always, because again, it depends what permissions you granted to that app. Right. So, like, we we found an app recently that was a, a actually from a stock trading company, and they paid somebody to take their PC based app and convert it to so it'd run on Android. And the people who did it used a toolkit that um, lets non native code run on Android. Well, w when you agree to run it, you install that toolkit, which, by the way, does not come off Google Play, it's installed off their website on your phone. That's really dangerous. That thing is a, that thing doesn't get deleted, and it's available mm. to all other apps, and you can download new code into it. Oh. So in that case, I mean, if you find something that truly is malicious like that, you may want to wipe your phone and update to the latest OS and then reinstall the apps that you want. Wow. Very rare, but when you find you've got something that's malicious like that, you probably want to do that on Android. And just the fact it does exist. It's out there. Oh, it was being. It was be, We found this app being pushed by a brokerage firm to their employees, and wow. mo, but and most likely unbeknownst to them, it's it's. Totally, a, they didn't know. They're like, wait, what? Why? Why are you guys at Proofpoint flagging it as malware? And we're looking at it and going, because it's using this distribution toolkit that your sloppy programmer used. Yeah. They didn't know either, but that yeah. thing's been used to distribute a whole bunch of Trojans and malware. Wow. Yikes. So what what approach does the big company have to take that's that differs from what we as consumers would have to take? What what can a company do to protect their users and uh, I think about bring your own devices and people bringing their phones from home. How do you protect against this kind of stuff? So that's where companies like we come in with Proofpoint as we're plugging into mobile device management systems which any smart company needs to deploy. Any company letting people use mobile devices to get onto their networks, to access their apps and internal corporate apps, or even to get email and calendar, needs some form of mobile device management system. And those are available for Android, iPhones, and for BlackBerry, um, and coming out for Windows phones too. And you need to have that, and then you need to tie in like a, an advanced threat detection 
product like what we're offering, a proof point, which lets you see what apps are really doing, where they're sending data, are they malicious, and being able to have sort of that automated control that works back with the company so that even if it's BYOD and I bring my own tablet to work, you know, my kid loaded something malicious on it, unbeknownst to me on the weekend, it'll detect that and it'll tell me how to get rid of it or get rid of it for me. So companies have really got to start doing that. And they are. Very good. Uh, so does the Proofpoint product, does it provide some kind of a, an infrastructure for the IT admins to be able to oversee all of their mobile devices within the network? Yeah, we do. So you can basically go in there and oversee the devices. And we pay a lot of attention to privacy. So you can set it up so IT can see what's happening with devices and what's on them, or they can set it up to have great degree of user privacy so that they don't know um, what's on your phone. They okay. just know whether it's safe or not. So you're protecting the users without actually violating your user's privacy. And, yeah. and then to bring your own device environment, that's, that's smart because uh, otherwise I may not want to use my home tablet. Right, and it saves uh, it saves resources uh, for the company as well. You can follow Proofpoint. It's at Proofpoint on Twitter, or visit their website Proofpoint.com. Tonight, we've been speaking with Dave Jevons, the the vice president of mobile security at Proofpoint. Dave, it's been a pleasure having you here. It's been great talking with you guys. Now, Dave, one question before we do let you go. It's the last one that's popping up on the website. Uh, is there a reputable list of some of the worst apps to avoid that people may not think mm. of? so that you can go on a website and be like, oh, these are the apps I should not be going to use. Not that I know of. It's a good idea. I'll take a look at creating one. <laughs> we're going to see, we're gonna see it soon, coming soon from Proof Point. Coming soon. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for being here. And, and I know it was short notice to come onto the show after last week's revelation and some of the things that we've seen happening this week. It's uh, a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you. And uh, all the best with your endeavors to keep companies and users uh, safe. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care. Thanks. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. My name's Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. That's <laughs> Jeff. Sorry, slow on <laughs> the uptake. <laughs> <laughs> Well, folks, you can find our website, www.category5.tv. And as we were saying tonight, check out proofpoint.com, just like it sounds. Mm -hmm. Nice and easy, or follow them, Proofpoint, on Twitter. Uh, great resource, I find, their Twitter feed, uh, because they do post a lot of uh, great articles that have to do with keeping yourself safe in the mobile marketplace. And, uh, and you can learn a lot about, uh, about security and, and uh, everything from a consumer perspective, but also uh, their products, of course, are going to protect you on the, on the corporate level. Mm -hmm. So check them out at Proofpoint on Twitter. That was a great interview. So much information. There. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have Dave here. Loved it. And thank you very much to everybody in the chat room who posed some questions. Lots of good stuff coming out of there. I know there's some questions we didn't get to, so I apologize for that. Uh, I just kind of ran out of time. Hey, you know what? If you had a question for Dave and you want to get it into him, email us live at category5.tv. We'll make sure to forward that along. Mm -hmm.